You have excessively mentioned in your speech as well as in your answers that EU is not to be considered uh, a, as a military organization, which is pretty obvious, I believe. But still, uh, do you are you familiar with the critique coming uh, mostly from Eastern-orientated think tanks, but not only from the uh, in the European Union, their opinions also on this issue that. Uh, Taking into the, uh, the account uh, the recent events of the recent decade, uh, to be more specific, like uh, your mentioned Cologne summit and afterwards uh, Amsterdam treat and then the mess in Kosovo and afterwards Nice treat and eventually the amendments made by the Lisbon treat, you is not longer to be called purely uh, economically and politically soft power because of the of the military initiative specifically because not all of them can be referred to the development assistance or to the peacekeeping operations because such initiatives as battle group initiative and other initiatives are based on the principle of the reaction uh, rapid reaction forces and uh, might provide the uh, processes which are not uh, was so much reactive but proactive too, so more aggressive at the same time. Okay, no, it's a very good question because it is true that for a long time the cliche about the European Union in international affairs has been it's an economic giant but a political pygmy. Hmm? Uh, you know, the European Commission and EU member states combined are the biggest development spenders in the world. You know, the EU is a superpower in development spending. Uh, and one of the ideas at the Cologne Summit in 1999, aside from trying to ensure Europeans could respond by themselves to crises in their own neighborhood, uh, was exactly to have a military option for EU foreign policy uh, as part of the holistic approach that I went into earlier. But you raised a more interesting question in a way because the key question then is, what capabilities do you have? Uh, and I already hinted at in my presentation, we have real difficulties with, cap with military capability in Europe, even though we're the second largest spender collectively uh, in the world on um, a military spender, uh, we don't have very much capability to show for it. We actually have more personnel in our armed forces in the U27 than the United States. Uh, but we can only deploy 100,000 out of 1.7, 1.8 million personnel. We can only deploy and sustain 100,000. That's 5 to 10 percent. It's not very impressive, whereas the US can deploy half its army quite quickly. Uh, to put it in another way, we have access to around 8 C-17s. The Americans have around 200 C-17s, whereas we have 10,000 main battle tanks. You know, uh, I'm not sure that we need 10,000 main battle tanks. Now, the capabilities question matters now today because of the budget crisis. Because a lot of people in Brussels argue the budget crisis is an opportunity. We recognize that we have a problem. We recognize that we haven't all reformed our armed forces from a territorial stance. That we need more equipment, we need more useful soldiers. Uh, but we're going to face huge cuts. So if we want to keep the capability that we have, because you need those capabilities if you're going to be taken seriously, because you may have to cope with crises much larger than what we've had to cope with so far. If, though, we want to keep those capabilities, it seems to me that we're going to have to pull it, or otherwise we'll lose it. And in Brussels, the argument is quite common that budget cuts is an opportunity to share, because that way the economies of scale, uh, you can share uh, money, you can train soldiers together, you can buy equipment together, you can develop equipment together. These are the types of arguments you hear. Now, of course, there are many examples where that hasn't worked too well. Who remembers the Euro Corps? The A400M is over budget, it's late. But the fact is, if we don't share and we don't pool, then member states will be stuck with a much more limited capability on a national basis than they currently have, given the budget cuts. They just can't sustain it. So a key question is, if EU member states don't pool and share, and that's also important for NATO or for the United Nations, we're going to end up with a much, uh, a much weaker capability, actually, than we even have today, and we're already heavily criticized. Uh, you might remember the speech by the US Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, I think it was in February of this year at the National Defense University, where he talked about the demilitarization of Europe and how this was threatening the credibility of NATO. Uh, well, it also threatens the credibility of the European Union. 
and, and we'll continue to be demilitarized in Gates's language uh, with these budget cuts unless we find a way to pool our resources. And I'm not suggesting a European army, by the way, just to be clear about it. I am suggesting that more member states will have to share more units and train together, based a little bit like the battle groups model, but perhaps larger in formation. The key thing is that member states have a veto over and decide when their soldiers are deployed. That's the key point. Uh, that means it can't be a European army. I'm not talking about creating a federal super state in Brussels, but we definitely have to find a way to integrate and cooperate much better in military terms. Otherwise, we just won't have the capability. That, what place, what role do you see for the, that option of first refusal in the relationship with, between NATO and European Union? I mean that uh, European Union can use NATO capabilities uh, only if NATO refuses to do it in one or another region. So talking about saving capabilities in this strict austerity times, it might be quite useful. Uh, well, actually, you mean that NATO gets first choice. Yeah. But it's not actually true. Uh, if you remember back to 2003 when the EU had an operation in Congo, the Artemis operation, NATO wasn't informed about it at all. And in fact, the Americans were quite surprised because <laughs> they assumed that they had first refusal. But it's not actually true uh, that NATO has first refusal. Um, and I don't see why, should, why NATO should have first refusal, frankly. Uh, no, NATO has access to American capabilities. They're not NATO capabilities, except the AWACS. That's the, that's the whole issue. Um, hi, I would just like to ask, um, you talked about Europe possibly pooling resources. Um, what do you think of the future nuclear capabilities of Europe? So France and Britain at the moment are both discussing the future of their nuclear programs. Do you think there would be any willingness at all within the European Union to pool these resources? Obviously there's certain limits, but I think the German constitution and other treaties. Um, but yes, basically, do you think there would be any future over there? Okay. Now that's a fascinating question. I mean, normally, Nuclear questions aren't on the EU table in that sense. They're, they're a NATO issue because NATO is a military alliance and the EU is not. Um, what you're talking about, of course, it doesn't have to be on the EU table to have a, a European solution. And there are two questions. I mean, you mentioned the German case. As we all know, the nuclear debate in Germany is very interesting at the moment. And, of course, they would like to see, at least many Germans would like to see the removal of tactical nuclear weapons uh, from German soil, as indeed other member states of NATO and the European Union would as well. But the big question is, can you get France and Britain to cooperate if you want a European nuclear force? Which actually is really what John F. Kennedy wanted in the early 60s. Um, will Britain and France cooperate? Uh, no. <laughs> is the short answer. I mean, it, it's fascinating to me. I've lived in both London and Paris, and I've tried to follow both debates closely. And there's a couple of big differences. It's not just about the British cooperation with the Americans uh, on the actual missiles and their technology, whereas the French, of course, have a completely independent deterrent. Uh, that's part of the story, but it's not the only part of the story. The other interesting thing right now in these debates is you have a much more open discussion about the future of Trident, as the UK system is known, uh, about really whether it should survive, or if it does survive, how much will it be cut, all those types of things. And there's a lot of criticism of uh, the fact that the UK has these nuclear weapons, and sure, if the Americans can halt its use, what uses it anyway, and why do you need a nuclear deter deterrence in today's world? I have never heard anyone say anything like that in Paris, ever. It's just, it's a holy cow. Uh, the French will not give up nuclear weapons for anybody. Uh, now, that doesn't mean they're not open to cooperating with the UK per se, but then the question is, would they allow the Americans to maintain a say or not? And I'm, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, I think it's too difficult an issue right now. But you do raise another issue, 
The fact is the future of CSDP politically will depend really on cooperation between Britain and France. Britain and France are the two biggest military powers. They are two of the biggest defence spenders. They're around 45%, and actually the way the budget cuts are going, their share of EU defence spending is going to go up. In some ways, you know, CSDP is a tale of two cities. You might remember the Dickens novel uh, of Paris and London, because they are the most strategic. They have the most experience of external deployments. They were the only ones that could run national operations outside their own territory. But of course, one of the main reasons we've had such difficulties in the defence debate in NATO and in the EU is precisely because Britain and France didn't share a strategic outlook. Um, if they don't develop a common strategic outlook, uh, then I'm not sure CSDP, EU defence, or NATO for that matter, will have a very comfortable future. Uh, but on the other hand, while they may not cooperate on nuclear weapons yet, there are ongoing discussions about cooperating on other types of equipment, like aircraft carriers. I'm sure you're well aware of it. And the hope is that there is a summit on November 2nd, I think, an Anglo-French summit, that we may see an announcement that Britain and France both do want to start sharing capability. Because frankly, I'm not sure they have much choice. Uh, because the types of cuts both of them are going through. But uh, given the French position, the differences in the French debate and the British debate at the moment, I don't see any possibility for Anglo-French cooperation uh, on, on nuclear weapons.